Hello and welcome to the Darth Magog channel. I'm your host, the Dark Lord of the Apostates, Darth Magog. And today, I'm surprised to admit that Jehovah's Witness religion is becoming more lenient. In Governing Body Update 8 of 2023, of all people, Stephen Lett was the one to make this following announcement. I present it to you, unedited for transparency and critique purposes. Here's Stephen Lett. A number of branch offices around the world have written to us indicating that there continue to be questions about whether or not it is proper for a brother in an appointed position to wear a beard. After prayerful consideration, the governing body has concluded that there is a need to clarify this matter. The governing body does not have an issue with brothers wearing beards. Why not? Because the scriptures do not condemn the wearing of beards. Furthermore, as time has passed, we have noted that in many lands, it is acceptable for men who hold responsible positions in business and government to wear beards. Thus, whether a brother wears a beard is a personal decision. Yes, you heard right, XJW agents. Jehovah's Witness men worldwide can now wear a beard and not be treated differently in the religion for it. Bizarre as it is, this is indeed a landmark announcement and a year of landmark announcements. Another one being that Jehovah's Witness time requirements for the ministry have been completely erased. And of course, the annual meeting announcement that one can find salvation in Jehovah's Witnesses after the Great Tribulation has started. So it begs the question, what other changes should we expect in the coming years? Well, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I have a few guesses at what could change and how I'd change it if it were up to me. Here are the top 10 changes I want to see in Jehovah's Witnesses. We would be honored if you would join us. Just to be clear, these changes are indeed fictional. While I would like to see Jehovah's Witnesses reform their religion, I have to think realistically. They're an ultra-conservative, fundamentalist, extremist religion that doesn't readily change unless there's enough pressure on them to convert the governing body into diamonds. Like when they legally couldn't sell watchtowers door-to-door, -door, they changed the ministry. So we'll start with little changes that would make the religion more palatable, even if completely unrecognizable. Preamble is out of the way, let's make the list. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. I'm going to heavily abridge this teaching. The witnesses believe that Jesus Christ began ruling invisibly from heaven in the year 1914. They've extrapolated this from a misreading of the biblical account of King Nebuchadnezzar and a misunderstanding of when Jerusalem was destroyed by the kingdom of Babylon, believing it to be in 607 rather than 589 BCE as most scholars do. They've attached this belief to a number of other prophecies and parables made by Jesus, most famously Matthew chapter 24 verse 34 generation that will never pass away. Unfortunately, this teaching is getting harder to reinforce, especially in the newer generation. There's plenty of archaeological evidence that proves via written record that Jerusalem was destroyed much closer to 587 or 589 BCE as opposed to 607, throwing the witnesses' math off by 20 years. Furthermore, the generation that could have been alive in 1914, never mind having witnessed any events, is rapidly dwindling. Jehovah's Witnesses have partially addressed this through a teaching they call the Overlapping Generation, where friends of those 1914 Witnesses could also count in their same generation. But all that mental gymnastics aside, now that we're over a century past the events of 1914, and the membership of the congregation continues to age, the teaching is holding less and less water in the information age. The way they'll need to explain the change teaching would likely be well done through Proverbs chapter 16 verse 11, which in the New World Translation reads as follows, Honest balances and scales are from Jehovah. All the weights in the bag are his doing meaning they could finally acknowledge the carbon dating and worldly measurements used by archaeologists to promote the correct date, 
and possibly move the goalposts another couple of decades. Ultimately, I predict that the religion will need to abandon the doctrine entirely in the not-too-distant future. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. Jehovah's Witnesses' most famous prohibition is the prohibition of holiday celebrations. This includes Christmas, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and even individual birthday celebrations. Their primary reasoning is found in the What Does the Bible Teach book in chapter 16. The chapter discusses the origins of holidays and festivals worldwide, citing false worship and idolatry. But as the world scene changes, the request is getting a little harder to justify, as many of these holidays now have very little religious meaning, and could be compared to other things that Jehovah's Witnesses use and participate in, pinatas and wedding rings being principal among the arguments against considering pagan origins when deciding what to participate in. If the governing body did roll back the restriction, they could easily put into play Romans chapter 14 verse 6. The one who observes the day observes it to Jehovah. Also, the one who eats, eats to Jehovah, for he gives thanks to God. And the one who does not eat, does not eat to Jehovah, and yet gives thanks to God. So a birthday or any other holiday could be used as an extra special day of celebration to Jehovah, as he ordered under the Mosaic Law. Still not a likely fix, but it would be interesting. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. Jehovah's Witnesses hold a very strong stance on marriage and divorce. They believe that marriage is a permanent bond and should ideally only be undertaken within the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses with a fellow believer. Though there are plenty of instances of people joining the religion after they're already married. And even in those cases, Jehovah's Witnesses firmly believe that the marriage is a holy arrangement and cannot be undone. The only exception being in cases of adultery, and even then, it's optional. A place they could loosen the teaching would be around what constitutes a divorce. Currently, the religion will allow a separation, though not a full divorce, under these circumstances. 1. If one spouse is purposefully not supporting the other. 2. Extreme physical abuse. And 3. If one spouse threatens the other's connection with Jehovah's Witnesses. The separation reasoning could be solidified into divorce reasoning under 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, which reads, Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship do righteous and lawlessness have, or what sharing does light have with darkness? As Jehovah's Witnesses say, he who knows the word but is false to its light is worse than an unbeliever. Or something like that, I guess. Either way, it's just enough gymnastics to make the rank and file go along with the new spiritual law. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. This isn't too far off from what happened with the beards, admittedly. Item of note here is that Jehovah's Witnesses are well known for their dress code. Unlike Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a specific uniform that they're expected to wear, but there is a specific way to dress. Suit and tie for men and boys, modest dresses and skirts for the girls. And believe me, they want those skirts and blouses very modest for women. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that dress and grooming is one of the things that sets them apart from the world around them, believing the trends of the world to promote debased thinking while their clean, modest dress implies a Christian attitude. And as world styles change and certain practices become more common the world over, such as women wearing trousers, it wouldn't be entirely out of place to believe that a neatly pressed pantsuit would be something that the governing body approves for Jehovah's Witness women. Their scriptural justification could easily be Luke chapter 16 verse 8, and his master commended the steward, though unrighteous, because he acted with practical wisdom. For the sons of this system of things are wiser in a practical way toward their own generation than the sons of the light are. Meaning, as long as something is clean and practical, it would be appropriate for Jehovah's Witness to wear to the Kingdom Hall and in field service. I doubt we'll start seeing jeans at the hall anytime soon, though. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. We've discussed disfellowshipping ad nauseum on this channel, but for any new viewers, I'll give a brief overview. Disfellowshipping is the act of Jehovah's Witnesses banning a member from their religion. This is for what they call unrepentant wrongdoing, and the reasoning ranges from excessive drinking and smoking, sexual immorality, and even disagreeing with Jehovah's Witness teaching. 
A member who is disfellowshipped is commonly shunned, meaning that active, practicing Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to interact with them, even if they're blood relatives. This very action has been a controversial aspect of the religion in the larger world around us. So much so that national governments such as Norway have begun withholding tax benefits and monetary grants from the Watchtower because they see the act of disfellowshipping as a violation of human rights, especially in the case of minor children. And given developments in Japan and New Zealand surrounding claims of abuse and children's rights violations, this could be the start of a new trend. A trend that could grossly impact the bottom line of Watchtower headquarters, in preparation for that, it's not out of the question to expect a loosening of the shunning arrangement or its abolition entirely. Historically, Jehovah's Witnesses didn't support this fellowshipping until the 1950s. In an old Awake magazine from January of 1947, the Witnesses use Hebrews chapter 10 verse 30 to demonstrate how unscriptural excommunication or shunning is. For we know the one who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, Jehovah will judge his people. This could justify a softened shunning where Jehovah's Witnesses just wouldn't have any religious interaction with disfellowshipped members, but could still keep in touch more regularly, especially as it applies to mine children and their extended family, keeping just within the bounds of international laws as Jehovah's Witnesses often like to do, so long as it suits their goals. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. A lesser-known prohibition in Jehovah's Witnesses are the practices of martial arts and yoga. While both arts are usually seen as self-defense and exercise respectively in the West, Watchtower and the Witnesses take issue with their historical spiritual origins. Additionally, even as simple sports, the time they take to develop skill in is considered a waste that could be better used studying Watchtower publications according to the religion. As attitudes change and these arts drift further and further away from their spiritual roots, I could see a universe where Jehovah's Witnesses would allow their brothers and sisters to take up Tai Chi or something similar at a local secular gym. I'm stretching, pun intended, with this one, but I did find a scripture that would support such a stance. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 should suffice. On the other hand, the fruitage of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, mildness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. With self-control and peace being at the core of almost any martial arts philosophy and even secular yoga goals, so long as the classes were strictly secular, there would be almost no justification for Jehovah's Witnesses to ban the practice. Well, at least yoga. Pacifism could be an argument against martial arts, but that's another thing we can discuss in the comments down below. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. I'm probably going to be laughed off my own Star Destroyer for this one, but hear me out. Female Elders and Jehovah's Witnesses. So, as you might be well aware, Jehovah's Witnesses are a largely patriarchal religion, meaning all of the leadership is male. This includes not only the elders, the equivalent of a Catholic priest, or the ministerial servants, the equivalent of a deacon or a junior priest, but even the men outside of formal Jehovah's Witness leadership have highest status in the congregation, with the ability to teach from the platform, handle sound equipment, and lead groups in door-to-door -door preaching work that the religion is famous for. The group has been criticized for it publicly, with the Australian Royal Commission and ICSA being prominent examples of such. Now, not unlike a JW marriage, I've settled on a three-fold cord that would lead the witnesses to the conclusion that female elders and ministerial servants would be okay to have in the congregation. 1. Jehovah's Witnesses already believe in female ministers and consider their baptized spiritual sisters to be ministers of Jehovah's Witnesses, meaning they can preach and teach their own students the same way a man can. 2. JWs already have women running mics and running equipment. It's mostly anecdotal evidence, so take this with a grain of salt, but in areas where there are no qualified men to perform a task required to conduct a meeting, like reading the literature, directing a preaching group, or operating audio equipment, women will perform the task. And three, there are already women amongst the anointed 144,000, who in JW theology will be priests with Jesus in heaven, so why not let them get started on their job while they're still on earth? 
given that this is mostly practical, I struggled to find a usable scripture, but I believe I found one here in Titus chapter 2 verse 3. Likewise, let the older women be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not enslaved to a lot of wine, teachers of what is good. The perfect counter to Paul's statement of women will be silent in previous books. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. Ah, the law of the watchtower that freed me, the discouraging of higher education. Jehovah's Witnesses truly, truly despise a formal education beyond what the law requires. They bemoan the financial cost, governmental ties, spirit of competition, academic pressure, and what they call an environment of sexual immorality and alcohol abuse. To a degree, this has been one of the easier teachings to justify in Jehovah's Witnesses as even the secular world is beginning to question the value of university education to an average student when juxtaposed to the expense. Though that debate still rages, and the current cultural climate is still strongly supports even a little college as an advantage for students entering the workforce. Should Jehovah's Witnesses shift their stance, the example of Ezra himself at Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 would be an easy way to support giving their children the choice. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a copyist who was well versed in the law of Moses, which Jehovah the God of Israel had given. The king granted everything he requested, for the hand of Jehovah his God was upon him. Having specialized in trades and skills has always been something Jehovah's Witnesses have taken advantage of in their Kingdom Hall building projects and other tasks at Bethel, so a guided college track for JW children might not be such a far-fetched future. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. The penultimate rule is probably one of the biggest issues in the religion, the Two Witness Rule. For the uninitiated, Jehovah's Witnesses are a very insular religion that doesn't like to involve the outside world in its affairs, even when it's an internal conflict amongst its members. Hence, it has its own procedures to deal with accusations and disagreements that's colloquially referred to as the Two Witness Rule, where one of Jehovah's Witnesses has to have a second witness to bring up a grievance with a fellow witness. This grievance can be something as simple as reneging on a business deal to something a bit more serious. The issue with this is that they'll use it in cases of domestic assault and even CSA, meaning that before anything gets done about it, the victim has to get the perpetrator to confess to congregation elders or else have the attack committed in front of another fellow Jehovah's Witness. Which, if I have to explain why that's absurd, especially in the case of abuse against a child, then I really just can't help you at all. Either way, as these cases stack and stack against the witnesses, they should be looking at their own internal processes. Sadly, it would likely be to protect their own bottom line and not the children specifically, but at this point, I'd be fine with Jehovah's Witnesses actually protecting children, even as an unintended side effect. An easy scripture that could be used to correct this grievous oversight while maintaining their silly rule is James chapter 1 verse 27. The form of worship that is clean and undefiled from the standpoint of our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their tribulation and to keep oneself without spot from the world. In action, when a child is being victimized would make the worship of Jehovah's Witnesses that have been told about it unclean and make them blood guilty as well, spotted with the world, and by their logic, big targets at Armageddon. I'm so upset that I have to phrase this in this way, but it's likely the only way we'll get a rule in writing about reporting CSA, so the victims can get justice and healing. And if that's what it takes, then so be it. You gotta keep on going, gotta keep on going. And for the finale, we'll be addressing the infamous Jehovah's Witness blood rule. Jehovah's Witnesses are forbidden to accept whole blood in medical treatments, though they are permitted to accept certain fractions of blood in a procedure. This has been a source of ridicule for the religion, in some cases rightly so as it pertains to children. The world over, Jehovah's Witnesses have often refused a blood infusion as part of life-saving medical treatment for their minor children. There have been cases where courts have overruled the parents' say in the matter on the grounds of child welfare, but too often a child will lose their life over the religious beliefs of their parents. It is worth noting that often children of Jehovah's Witnesses technically aren't considered Jehovah's Witnesses themselves by the religion. 
though the parents will raise them as such and even force them to participate in the religion as though they're a full-fledged member. Jehovah's Witnesses have previously acknowledged the usefulness of blood in medical treatment, meaning they are aware that it can and does save lives. With that information, there's a possibility that with mounting social pressure in continued state and private lawsuits, that the religion will be forced to change its stance on interfering in the medical treatment of its members. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 is a simple scripture to use to make the change make sense to a witness. Therefore, I appeal to you by the compassions of God, brothers, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, a sacred service with your power of reason. A preventable death would go against the scripture of not using the power of reason and not presenting your body as a living sacrifice, making it the number one change that Jehovah's Witnesses should make in their theology. Just to be clear, I don't expect Jehovah's Witnesses to make these changes any time this century. But if they actually manage to get the majority of this list, I can safely say I would have no trouble hanging up my cloak and new lightsaber for good. But what are your thoughts, XJW agents? Have I come up with good scriptures that would convince even the spiritually strongest anointed witness? Or am I a delusional dreamer grasping at straws in hopes of making the religion of my childhood more palatable so I can end my crusade prematurely? Whatever your opinion, I'd love to read it in the comments down below. Until next time, remember XJW agents, the elders may be watching you, but Darth Magog is watching the Watchtower.